crazy.
yeah, thank you for the discussion. That was uh, fun. I'm going to try and, uh, well, I will raise some of the issues that were raised in the discussion and also in the presentation and try to add some, uh, add a layer of explanation. We'll see how well I do. Okay, I'm going to start with why you might want to do multivariate analysis at all. What the general objectives are, why people use them, and I'm going to go through principal components one more time because actually it's the it's the most straightforward multivariate analysis, and one of the reasons is it does nothing at all. So I'll try to explain. That. And then I'll contrast that with uh, discriminant analysis, which is I think a little bit more complicated, and just try to show you in one or two slides what it attempts to do and how that's different. And then I'll talk about uh, uh, ordination methods using presence-absence data, which took me a little while to understand, and I'll try to um, show you a data set where you might be able to intuit a little bit uh, what it's doing, and then if I get a chance, I'll put some distance data. So why do we use multivariate statistics at all? Why are we having this discussion? Well, the reason is that data are usually, usually come in many variables at once. And, uh, uh, on just about everything that we study, you know, and I, ideally we would have a, a clear hypothesis and uh, we, would, we would be able to know exactly what we should measure right off the bat and just measure that thing. But studies are expensive and you usually want to measure a bunch of things as well. How do you deal with all this multivariate data? How do you display it? How do you show it to yourself? How do you communicate it? How do you analyze it? So a lot of these methods are used because supposedly they make it easier to find important patterns that might be difficult to um, find using univariate methods. And uh, I'll show you at least uh, one example of that. Um, usually what we want is some kind of ordination. And by that I mean we would like to take our observations of many variables, condense them somehow, put them along some kind of a, a gradient or a combination of variables to allow us to do at least a couple of things. And the first is so that we can see what is going on. So that we can visualize um, that data in a smaller number of dimensions just to, to see if there are any patterns that pop out. And uh, the second, and that was illustrated by the reading for this week, is to determine whether there are meaningful combinations of the original variables that can then be used in subsequent analysis to compare, say, with ecology. So we want to take our large number of variables, throw it into the, to R, and then come out with something like this, which goes, oh, you see that there's two clusters here. Maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that means something. That's, that's the desire. And if that happens, then you, know, you can think, OK, I better understand this, because I actually think the results make sense. Um, besides ordination, multivariate methods are also used for classification. So let's talk about that, uh, clustering and so on, to place sampling units into groups. And then uh, also, as was also mentioned, model fitting. So to, to carry out um, hypothesis testing and estimation using sets of variables all at once. And uh, what I'm going to do today is focus mostly on ordination, because I think it is the most straightforward, and uh, uh, it's not to say that you're on your own when it comes to these other objectives, but there's not um, a lot of time. So um, I'll do PCA and then also um, uh, coordinates, principal coordinates analysis. So PCA is pretty straightforward, and I'm going to use another bird example, and that's you know partly because you already read through one example and maybe partly understood it, and this will perhaps reinforce some of those points. So this is analysis of species differences in the uh, Galapagos finches. So here's like a black Galapagos finches, and you can see right off the bat, just from the headshots, that they differ in the size of the beak, the shape of the beak, and the, from the size of the head, that there might be an overall difference in um, size as well. So how best to summarize this? So here we have uh, Units, 13 species, 14 species of, uh, of Galapagos finch, and then a, a bunch of variables, and I'll keep it simple, just to five here. 
the wing length, tarsus length, bird people always measure the same thing. That's why there's sort of a resemblance to the previous study. <coughs> Hellman length, which is the length of the beak, depth of the beak, the vertical dimension, and then width of the beak. So uh, this is a, it's not a it's not a gigantic data set, but all of a sudden you realize there, there's some problems here. How do I even look at it? How do I get a sense of how different these are from all these measurements? Well, one is to just look at all pairwise associations, and there's a, a command in R called pairs, which will um, produce such plots for you. And uh, those can be really useful, highly recommended, even though you know, you're not going to sit down and carefully inspect every one of these plots. Some things leap out at you, like, oh wow, these two traits are pretty closely correlated, that's clear. And uh, you might also see um, outliers and things like that that might make you think, oh, maybe I should take a log transformation before I do anything else. In fact, that's what I did for this data set. Um, another, another method uh, invented by uh, someone, a statistician named Chernoff, are, are called uh, Chernoff faces. And uh, the idea behind the Chernoff face is that each uh, variable would be represented by a feature on a face. And then the face that emerges from the dimensions, you know, these are all beak and body dimensions, but each of those traits refers to a different facial feature. By looking at this, we would be able to see that some are different and some are similar. The idea being that, like, our, half our brain is dedicated to observing, interpreting faces, so why not make use of that machinery in, in order to look at things for which we're not particularly good at noticing. So, uh, anyway, th there's an R hat for that, and, uh, and uh, so, so you can do this if you want. Um, it, it's considered a somewhat eccentric tool, and uh, you probably haven't encountered it before. That's a great laugh. <laughs> so I threw the Galapagos Finch data into, uh, I took log transformations of everything and then threw it into a PCA, and this is what I got. And naturally the first question that comes to mind is, what am I looking at? <laughs> and that's a common response when looking at multivariate data, because, I mean, the idea of doing it in the first place is that somehow patterns will emerge that you can interpret. And honestly, uh, you know, I've had the experience of carrying out a multivariate analysis for that purpose only to have to be in a hasty retreat. Because, because sometimes in using these methods you might find that nothing really emerges. Nothing very intuitive or simple or anything like that, and that it would be far more work to explain the outcome that you got using your multivariate analysis than it would be just to stick with the univariate variables throw that in the appendix if it belongs there at all. Um, but I wanted to give you an intuition for what PCA actually does. So you were given some already from the uh, presentation by Raphael and Vince. One of the things that emerges is that most of the variation pops out on principal component one, and then some smaller, a much smaller fraction on principal component two. But what is this telling us? Um, even though we're working with five dimensions, my, uh, my goal um, and the hope is that most of the variation would actually be represented in two dimensions. And that means that if I, if I look at any two dots, that if, if I see that they're close together, then I know that the phenotypes of those two species are actually very similar. And that even though I've taken five and compressed it into two dimensions, uh, two points that are far apart uh, will generally be differences with species that are actually very different phenotypically. And that's uh, one of the main goals of ordination, just to allow you to visualize what's similar, what's different. And, uh, and so most of that is preserved, even though I have uh, thrown away three of the dimensions in this case. So that's the hope. You realize, you realize it's an approximation, there's some other dimensions that you're not including, but the hope is that with two, at least you've got a good idea of what the resemblance patterns are. Secondly, even though uh, these 
principal components are composite variables. Uh, in this case, as in many other cases, the variables are interpretable. So we heard about body size already, and that's exactly what emerges in this um, analysis. <clears throat> um, and in particular, in this case, the, the, the beaks are very different between the species on the right-hand side of the plot and those on the left-hand side of the plot. And, and they're different in a particular way. All the big beaks are on that side, and all the little beaks are on the right side. So, if it's possible to look at the coefficients that describe the combination of variables that were important in determining this, you, you automatically know which species have small beaks and which ones have large beaks. So again, you've summarized information in a compact way that at least gives you some insight. <clears throat> in this case, the second principal axis was also interpretable because when we compared the species, when we looked at the coefficients and compared the species, we went, oh, I get it. These, these two species here are actually very, fairly similar in terms of what you'd think of as overall beak size, but this is sort of longer and narrower, and this is sort of uh, uh, shorter and deeper. So this represents a <coughs> beak shape, and so uh, this tells you something about how the different species that you're looking at then differ in those attributes. So how, how it works. <clears throat> I'm going to try and persuade you that Principal components analysis really does nothing at all. It just takes the data that you've already got and turns it in a way that allows you to visualize it in one particular, uh, from, from one particular aspect, uh, in, in such a way that you're looking at most of the variation that's present. And in order to actually do the calculation, there's a couple of ways that one can represent um, all of the data and then throw it into a principal component analysis or, or an analogous method. And, and one is just to look at all the pairwise distances between all the species, the pairwise Euclidean distances. And pairwise Euclidean distance, as you'll remember from high school, is just the, uh, you know, the, the sum of the squared dimensions and then take the square root. The other way, though, and the way that principal components analysis is done, is it looks at the variables and the associations between them. So it starts out with an array called a covariance matrix, uh, which is basically got all the variables down the diagonal, and then the covariances down the side. So we're more used to thinking about correlations rather than covariances. And correlations are nothing more than the, the covariance is divided by the standard deviations. So their correlations are just standardized covariances. And covariances keep things in their original units. In this particular case, all of my units are in millimeters. And even though the data are on different scales, some of the you know, beaks varying this much, and, and some of the body size traits varying much more, by taking logs, we're essentially looking at um, uh, relative differences among them. And so it's reasonable, in this case, to think that all the traits are essentially on the same units on the same scale. In the paper that you read, uh, that was not the case. And so what was used in that case was the correlation matrix. But that is one of those subtle options that you make, make a judgment call on your way to doing this kind of analysis. So I want to show you how this works in two dimensions. There's the covariance matrix. There's the, for, for two of the traits, the length of the beak and the depth of the beak. So that's how variable uh, the, the traits are. Beak depth is more variable than beak length. And this is the covariance between the, the two. And here are all the species displayed in the two dimensions, the length of the beak and the depth of the beak. What principal components does, it's easiest to show this in two dimensions, is that it finds a linear transformation of the variables to make a composite variable that has maximum possible variance. So that was already illustrated, and I'm just showing this one more time to drive it home, that uh, this ellipse sort of summarizes the variation and covariation between those two traits. Literally, PC1 is the long axis of that ellipse. And PC2 then is perpendicular to PC1 and captures the remaining variation. And since there's only two dimensions here, there's only two PCs, but generally there are as many dimensions as there are traits. 
Certainly in the case of two dimensions, you've done nothing at all by calculating PC1 and PC2. But when you plot it, basically what you do is you turn it so that you visualize it now from this perspective. There's PC1, there's PC2. And other than that, certainly when there are only two traits, you've done nothing at all. All the distances between the, the, the species are entirely preserved by this uh, analysis. So all you've done is turn it around a little bit. As I said. Now, if I've taken five traits, boiled it down to just two, and thrown away the other three, ah, well now then the Euclidean distances are going to be different in just these two dimensions than in the five, but I'll bet they're pretty accurate. You can think of the rest of it as just sort of noise. And uh, this is the case if you, ha uh, if you use the covariance matrix. Everything stays in the same original unit. In some packages, and that's the default in R, in some packages the default is the correlation matrix. And that's the same thing, except that what you do before you're, you do your principal component analysis is you standardize all of your variables by having, uh, uh, by converting them all to, um, to have uh, a standard deviation of one. Potentially a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So you just simply standardize. So all the units then all become essentially a line same scale. So um, this new axis, so we've turned it, and we've got these two new axes that are the principal components. Those are linear combinations of the original traits, <clears throat> and they have variances as well, and covariances. The covariances are zero. That's why we rotated it and found these PCs. The second one is perpendicular to the first. The third would be perpendicular or orthogonal to the first two if we went as far as that. Um, but what we have now are the uh, new variances for the uh, along the diagonal, the variance of PC1 and the variance of PC2. And just to make things difficult, those are called eigenvalues. Uh, but they're nothing more than variances. And uh, the the sum of the variances along the diagonal, if you have all the PCs included, is exactly the same as the sum of the variances of the original traits. Like I said, principal component analysis does nothing at all. It changes nothing. But the leading eigenvalue, the variance of PC1, is the largest. It's the direction for which the variance is highest the long axis of the ellipse. So, um, just to make life difficult, the, the coefficients that transform the original axes to the PCs, like I said, they're a linear transformation. You literally go 0 0.413 times the Kalman length of, a, of a, a species, plus 0 0.911 times its beat depth, gives you its measurement on PC1 just the linear transformation. And uh, to, keep things, uh, to make things difficult, these are called eigenvectors. I guess a bunch of Germans invented this method. <laughs> so the, the, the coefficients for PC2 are interpretable in exactly the same way. We calculate this score, as it's sometimes referred to on PC2, literally by going minus 0.9010 so they're just the numbers that you use to multiply the original traits by to get this. And that's how you turn the, the scatter plot of your dimensions in such a way that you can look at it. Turning is described by a linear transformation of the original axes. And they can be called, uh, oh yeah, the positions along the axes are often called scores in this uh, literature, and these are often called uh, loadings but they're just coefficients, the things you multiply the traits by. And they call, they, I guess they're called loadings because they indicate, uh, they indicate the contribution of each variable to the principal component. And uh, that's how uh, the judgment calls are made as to how to interpret these axes. So if you look at the coefficients for 
PC1, you see that the species at this end have larger and deeper beaks, and the species down at the other end have smaller and narrower beaks. Let's call PC1 beak size. So there's no real trait called beak size. We don't really have a, an a priori idea as to what we mean by beak size before we do this analysis. Instead, we just look at the numbers and go, I'm going to call this beak size because everything increases together. All the beak dimensions are bigger on this side. All the beak dimensions are smaller on that side. Simple. <clears throat> uh, but when we look at this one, we realize, OK, well, the, now beak length is negative and beak depth is positive. <clears throat> I'm going to call that shape because it separates individuals at, at, at this end with long, narrow beaks with individuals at this end with uh, uh, short beaks. And so that's how these interpretations arise. They arise from looking at the coefficient and going, I'm going to call this such. I'm going to call this, um, what was the variable that you said in your analysis? Well, it was well-being. Well-being. I'm going to call this well-being. And so when you look at these coefficients and they become interpretable, then, uh, you know, then they can be useful. You begin to think that maybe they're real. Like there is a real axis called peak shape. Um, there's a danger in this, but um, one, of them, one of them being frequently you wonder whether someone else could actually ever repeat your analysis really and on a different group of birds maybe and get something that they call beak size that's not actually the same as your beak size. So one has to be careful when one compares things that you've just named uh, on the basis of interpreting what those coefficients are. So we saw uh, um, the three-dimensional case, too, and I thought I would uh, show you one more time, because three dimensions is the highest number that allows you still to visualize uh, the relationship between what the data show and what the, um, the scatter plot shows in two dimensions. And I found this example online, and I thought, I tried to steal it, but the authors have prevented us from downloading the actual movie. <laughs> so here's now three dimensions, and this represents a, a, a movie, a graph movie. I talked about movable graphs in the first uh, week of the class as a as sort of a last idea, whether it's a good idea to... There's no reason why all our papers can't have movable graphs like this. But anyway, what do you do with three dimensions? Well, in this case, <coughs> You know, you can still sort of imagine that uh, if you describe this with an ellipsoid in three dimensions, that again, the long axis of that ellipse would be PC1. So what we're now trying to do in three dimensions what we did previously in two, and the principle is kind of the same. So from the original axes, we've gone to uh, you know, PC1, which is now the red. That's the long axis of the ellipse. But now we have two other dimensions to work with, and it turns out that this direction is more variable than that direction. So that becomes PC2 and that PC3. And I'm not showing PC3 here, I'm just showing 1 and 2. So that's what it would look like when you um, plotted it in two dimensions. And really, all we've done, literally in this case, is turn the scatter plot in three dimensions to, in, in such a way that we capture most of the signal in two dimensions. So in that sense, principal component analysis, even though there's a jargon associated with it, and there's a machinery associated with it, uh, it's, it's the lightest of the multivariate methods. And it's the easiest, not only to understand, but I think to interpret. And so you may not have a career in multivariate statistics ahead, but at least I hope that you, if it's useful, uh, will not shy away from PCA, because as I said, it does nothing at all. <clears throat> Same idea with five. Okay. It's just hard. I can't draw you a five-dimensional scatter plot, but you get the idea. And um, uh, this is uh, what was already shown in the presentation. It's called a scree plot, and 
you'll have an opportunity to run a principal component analysis in the workshop this week and then also to produce these scree plots. And the scree plots, basically, they're just a, a bar graph of the magnitude of the, um, of the variances. And this allows you to sort of visualize how the first principal component analysis, the first principal component really does account for a large fraction of the total variation. And the rest of the contributions are relatively more minor. So here's what I got in five dimensions. Uh, again, here are the five traits, and these are the loadings. And again, they're just the coefficients. How you would calculate PC1 is minus 0.195 times wing length, plus minus 0.192, and so on. And so this tells you um, which traits uh, are most important in determining variation along this first principle component analysis. And in this case, uh, the first thing that strikes you is they're all negative. And that just means that they are all um, contributing in the same direction. They're all contributing in the same way to variation along that axis. And, uh, and it looks like, well, beak depth is doing the most, but again, the beak traits are primarily, are, are, are the biggest numbers along PC1. So we would look at that and go, yeah, PC1 is pretty much beak size. It's not body size in the Galapagos finches, it's beak size. There's more variation in their sizes of the beaks of these birds than there is in the size of the bodies. Okay, let's try this again with PC2. Well, which are the big numbers? Let's say maybe these two are the biggest numbers. And uh, they're in opposite directions. So let's call this beak shape. PC3 is primarily tarsus and nothing else. So PC3 is mainly variation among individuals in, the, in, in their tarsus. Uh, you know, after all of the variation, what little variation in uh, tarsus is associated with 1 and 2, and so on. So here again, even though there's five dimensions, it's still reasonably interpretable. Once you get to four, well, it starts to become a little bit more challenging. And that's when people decide to go, well, I can interpret these three, not those. Eh, they don't count for much of the variance anyway. So let's just uh, <laughs> use them. And um, there are methods for deciding where the cutoff is, but they're not hard and fast. And they're all made up anyway. <laughs> I thought I would show you one more example of a principal component analysis. And uh, th th this example is perhaps my favorite example of a principal component analysis. And uh, it was um, uh, in a paper by November uh, et al. And uh, here's a, an example where it might be very difficult to visualize these data in um, all of the dimensions. As, as was said in the introduction, every trait is a different dimension. So I showed you two dimensions. With a movie, I showed you three traits, three dimensions. This is an analysis of 197,146 dimensions. I love this. And then, and, then, and then they produce a plot in two dimensions, which I'm not showing on the right. So the data set was 1,387 individual humans sampled from Europe. What are these traits? Actually, they're, they're nucleotides in the human genome. So this is analysis of complete genome sequences. And uh, principal components analysis is a, a really popular method in the analysis of genome sequences. You see it more and more. Why? Because there are so many dimensions. How do you get a handle on what the <coughs> they are actually showing? Unless you boil it down to a smaller number of dimensions. And then again, you can always beat a hasty retreat if nothing interpretable uh, emerges. But as I said, PCA does nothing, and so all we're doing is turning 197,146 dimensions and then trying to find a perspective that accounts for most of the variation, the second most variation, and so on. Uh, so the, the, the data are the nucleotides, and so there's three genotypes that every locus, you know, big A, big A, big A, little A, little A, little A, and the data are just zeros, ones, and twos. So they're just counts of the number of little A alleles of the individual. So that's the measurement made on each individual at each of these 197,146 traits. So then you create a covariance matrix of with, with 197,146 rows and as many columns. And um, 
the, the routine that the, the program that we're going to use in the workshop in R would have difficulty with this. Uh, so special methods are needed to, to, to figure out or to calculate the principal components. But that's all, who cares? R can do it. That's all we need to know. So what this plot is, is, uh, is uh, just where all the individuals fell on PC1 and PC2. And uh, what uh, the colors mean is the colors mean country. So the PCA analysis itself has no idea who's in what country. All it has is the traits. But the researchers have uh, plotted uh, various colors to show um, the countries of the, of the European countries that the individuals were sampled from. And one thing immediately leaps out from this graph, and that is that individuals from the same country plot together. And so already from you know, reducing the data down to a really small number of dimensions, two from, you know the number. Uh, we already learned something really valuable, which is that at least on, on, on these dimensions, individuals that live close together are genetically more similar than uh, individuals who live in different countries. So that's a pretty useful finding. That means that we're finding structure in the data that would have been impossible to find. Uh, you know, by analyzing the traits one at a time, <clears throat> and, and who knows how we would have analyzed them uh, all together. The circles represent the country means. Now this, uh, this study uh, did one more thing, and, and what I'm going to do is uh, show you a plot of exactly the same data, but now I'm going to turn it. <clears throat> what the authors also did is they color-coded the countries of Europe with the, with the same colors as in the PC plot. So all I did was, was, was just rotate it. And not only do people who live in the same country, not only are they genetically more similar to one another than people who live in different countries, but um, the, the, the PC plot actually replicates the geography of the countries that are included in this analysis. It's just amazing. And, and so much so that, like, here's the Mediterranean, no people. <laughs> here's, here's Italy's boot. Here's the Iberian Peninsula with Spain and Portugal. Fantastic. I just looked at this and it made me happy. <laughs> so there, yeah, England and, and Ireland, Scotland. It's extraordinary. They have a separate plot where they show that you can tell the French-speaking part and the German-speaking part of Switzerland uh, apart as well, and that, that is also replicated on the map. <clears throat> Why does this happen? Well, uh, Europe, Europe's an old place, and, uh, and, and prior to the you know, Industrial Revolution and so on, people didn't move very much. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, and, and, and so geography to a large part told you a lot about the, the, the people who lived there and uh, how long they've been there. And that uh, countries that are close probably exchange more genes than countries that are distant. So, so people move locally and that would produce a pattern just like this. They don't even cross the Mediterranean. Uh, it's not perfect, like, what's with the Italians down there? <laughs> and what is Slovakia doing here? But there aren't very many Slovakians in the, in the uh, uh, data set. Anyway, I wanted to show you that example just because it is possible to imagine taking a large number of traits and representing it in order to see important structure in the data that might not be possible otherwise. So I want to show a couple more um, methods that are, are used, and one of them is discriminant function analysis, and I just wanted to do it quickly to point out how it is not principal component analysis. So um, discriminant function analysis isn't really used for ordination, it's used more for classification. And the one difference it, it is immediate when you, when you run a discriminant analysis, and that is principal component analysis is um, doesn't know anything about the, the structure, like who comes from what group. It's, it's uh, the analysis I just showed you 
on the genotypes, the human genomes from Europe. Uh, the analysis itself didn't know who lived where, just did the analysis and the geographic structure emerged. But discriminant analysis, you tell it what the groups are. And then you ask it to find you a combination of variables, not that summarizes the variation, but that discriminates the two groups so that you can then classify. If you did a principal component analysis on these two traits, well, you'd first sort of imagine that there's a, an ellipse that summarizes the variation and covariation between those two traits, and PC1 is just the long axis of that ellipse. But these two groups overlap tremendously on PC1. PC1 is useless for discriminating those two groups. And that's why discriminant analysis was invented. So now what I've done is I've put separate ellipses uh, around each of the groups. And what discriminant function analysis is, uh, tries to do is find the direction that maximally discriminates those groups. And in this case, that's not PC1 at all. In fact, it, it's not the direction of maximum variance. In this particular hypothetical example, it's actually the direction of less um, variance. But you can see how if you measured every individual's score along this axis here, you'd, you'd be much better able to tell which individuals belong to this group and which belong to this group. And uh, so there's a histogram of the um, discriminant function, the first discriminant function. There's only one discriminant function when there's two groups. Two when there's three groups, and so on. So this is the axis that maximally separates the two groups, and so now this is one that we can use for classification. Well, the way uh, discriminant analysis is often done is that half the data are used to create the classification variable, the discriminant function, and then that's used to see how well it does at classifying the other half of the data as successfully it. So it's a cross-validation type method that we um, heard about before. That's discriminant analysis. The mathematical machinery is, is, is there. But in thinking about what discriminant analysis does, I find it easier to imagine how it works graphically. Uh, the last method I want to show you is uh, correspondence analysis. So this is a, an ordination method that's used more in ecology. But it has some similarities to uh, principal component analysis, and I want to give you an example and maybe show you how you might intuit what it means. So the way correspondence analysis works is that you might visit a variety, uh, visit a bunch of study sites, and record what species are present. And so again, you have a data set of study sites, and then uh, which species are present, which species are absent. And again, we take a, a matrix of associations, <clears throat> like a covariance matrix between the variables. But here, correspondence analysis uses a, a contingency table, a row by column contingency table that you're accustomed to using when you do a chi-square goodness of fit. Chi-square goodness of fit measures, essentially, the magnitude of the discrepancy between the um, the contingency table and what you would expect if there was no association. And correspondence analysis is based on that same principle. So here's the data set that I uh, used. And uh, the units, again, are uh, down the side, there are the sites. So here are four sites, just to keep it simple. And then here are the 16 ant species that uh, were recorded as present or absent. So this is a contingency table. And so it's possible to, you know, use chi-square. I realize that ones and zeros causes problems for the approximation to the chi-square distribution, but at least you're familiar enough with contingency tables to know that you can summarize the lack of independence, in other words, the association between units and variables using some sort of a chi-square. And the, and the chi-square measures the sort of the discrepancy. In every cell, it measures the discrepancy between what you expect under independence and what you've got. And the chi-square statistics sums that up across all cells. So, um, basically, the association between sites and uh, species is, 
you know, thrown into very similar machinery uh, as we do for principal component analysis with the idea that we'll end up by taking this sort of multi-dimensional data set on species and sites, boil it down to two dimensions that we can visualize. And that hopefully gives us a similar kind of information. And the first kind of information that we want to get is that ant species that occur close together in this plot um, actually co-occur a lot with one another. And ant species that are far apart in this plot tend not to co-occur. And uh, this is a sites by species association. And so the, uh, w we get scores not just for the species, but also for the sites. Because this is all based on the strength of association between those two variables uh, measured using this uh, chi-score statistic. And so again, here are the four sites that on this plot, three, two, one, and four. And so looking at this, uh, we can see, ah, that species number three tends to occur at site two, but maybe not other sites. And uh, sites four and one tend to be similar in their species composition, and, a four, and species 14 is present in both, and so on. Okay, so whereas uh, site three and uh, site four uh, probably, well, they do have very different compositions of ant species. So the table, the contingency table, is a pretty complex thing to look at, but correspondence analysis is an attempt to take the associations, break them down, and look at them in such a way that points that fall together are strongly associated and points that are far apart are not. Now, what I did was, what I want to do also is try and give you a little bit of intuition for how this works and what contributes to the positions of sites and species on this um, axis. So what I've done is I've rearranged all of the ant species. What am I doing for time? I have to rearrange all the ant species so that um, here are all the ones that are present in Vermont. Here are the ones that are present on Maine Islands. And uh, these are the in-between, those that are present in Connecticut and in Vermont, or in Connecticut and in the mainland of Maine. And uh, so I've reshaped the matrix, so now you can start to see, even in this table, the association between sites and species. And you can also see that uh, Vermont, which is site four, is relatively similar to Connecticut in which species are present and which ones are absent. And that's why they land fairly close. And it makes sense that the two sites would follow close to one another. Whereas species composition is relatively low between main islands, site three and Vermont, but somewhat closer to site two. <clears throat> so no environmental data have gone into this analysis. It's all based on association. But this first axis behaves as though it's an environmental gradient. It's almost as though something is different uh, in Vermont from, the, from, from Maine, and especially from the islands, as though maybe there's a climate variable that might explain the sort of it, this gradual transition from a composition of species like this one to a composition of species like this one. And so it's all done um, without any knowledge of the environmental gradients, but at the same time, the axis now might suggest an environmental gradient that's important. If we looked at a map, we might see that, you know, Maine and Vermont, east, west, one's more. So we might start to think about hypotheses to explain, um, you know, the underlying climate or habitat variables that might be responsible for this pattern of ant species. So suddenly we've learned something about ants we may not have known. It's an aspect of their biology. 
So again, this is just ordination. I haven't tested anything. All I'm trying to do is reduce things to such an extent that I can now start to see patterns that would be more difficult to see in the original data set. And uh, I don't have an example based on 197,000 uh, sites and species, but in principle, nothing would prevent me from uh, doing the same with a much more complicated data set where it was even more difficult perhaps to see these associations from, from scratch. And you also get things they call eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And here, the axis um, is based on an association uh, uh, statistic from the contingency table. And this sort of tells you that axis one explains uh, about you know, more than half of the association between sites and species. And uh, um, axis two uh, explains a smaller fraction of the association between sites and species. I think if you actually want to get fractions of uh, a, a variance, you have to square those. So I would have to look up exactly the interpretation of those magnitudes, but the relative magnitudes are enough for now. So uh, I said that it's usually the case, and is the case here, that it's possible to interpret the first axis, um, but um, my experience in attempting to, to run these analyses is that it, the second axis is more difficult to interpret. And we're not seeing the pattern here, but often in these ordination analyses, the sites and species are aligned along uh, a horseshoe. And that in, usually indicates that something weird is, is going on. And indeed, something weird is usually going on, in my experience, for, for the, the second axis. Because you ask yourself, well, what exactly does site three and four have in common that makes them similar on, uh, on the second axis when they're so far apart on the first axis? And uh, the answer is, so which ones are they? Yeah, three and four or one. The answer is that often similarity along the second axis is the result of um, having in common uh, species that are, are missing. So, so uh, it's not really telling you much about what species are present in both sites. You know, the first axis is, is better at doing that, but the second axis is often hard to interpret and weird. And one of the reasons is, is because it's the shared missing species that often determines how similar sites are. And that's not necessarily very useful. So in my experience with this method, the first axis is usually interpretable, but the second one is dodgy. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. I had one more example, but it's actually very similar to the um, to the genome example that uh, I already showed you. So I'm gonna skip over that. Oops. And say that uh, next week is the last week of the, of the class. And uh, next week I'm gonna go lecture on how one uh, does statistics when the data points are species and, uh, or, or, or populations. And, and the reason that uh, has become recognized as an important issue is that species are independent data points in the same way that individuals are, are a random sample from a population. And the reason is that um, species are more or less related to one another as a result of shared phylogenetic history. So then the question is, how do you analyze data like that? How do you compare um, traits between species um, when phylogeny is part of the picture? You, you got to taste that. I, I, I said that you should ignore that feature of the reading that I asked you to do for today. Um, but you've already got an idea of how that's accomplished. And uh, so that's what I want to talk about in my lecture next week. But I thought that rather than read another paper on uh, phylogenetic analysis, that we would actually do something a little different and just read a paper where uh, phylogeny is also used in uh, an ecological and evolutionary context. And that is in the uh, decision of what is phylogenetically distinct. In the idea that knowing that will help us decide 
which species are worth more or worth, worth, worth more money and effort. You know, if you want to save one of a number of stickleback or you want to save a coelacanth. We'll have that discussion next week. <laughs> so we have our presenters and our moderators. That means that everyone will have had the opportunity and by this point. So my calculations at the beginning of the year were exact. Thank goodness. Once I taught this course and somebody dropped out late in the course, and so one person got up and gave a presentation. And I was a little sad. Okay, to uh, sit at the workshop on Thursday, multivariate. Yeah. 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 Yeah.